Thanks, David. And uh, I want to join, add my welcome to uh, David. I'm so glad you guys could all join us here. Um, we're really excited to be able to not just share some of the research we've been doing, but very much looking forward to hearing all of your questions and comments and, and having this be interactive. Um, so what I'd like to talk about right now is just frame what we're doing a little bit. Uh, we think this is a very interesting time in human history, and we think this is a very interesting place to be here, especially here at MIT, where many of the developments are emerging and, and happening. And we've brought people in from all over the world who are also contributing and, and, and uh, changing the world in a lot of ways. When Andy and I wrote uh, our book, The Second Machine Age, uh, we came across an interesting chart that we put in the first chapter about how human history has evolved. And uh, you could look at a lot of different dimensions of human history, but if you look at things like uh, GDP or GDP per person or population or, or something called a, a human development, uh, social development index, um, they all show a very similar uh, interesting inflection point, which is that for literally thousands of years, not much happened to basic human living standards and even basic population. And then in the late 1700s, things really changed quite dramatically. And there are perhaps a number of reasons for that, but being here at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, we zoomed in on the, the role of technology. One technology in particular, uh, Watt's steam engine was developed then, and that helped ignite the Industrial Revolution and set in place a cascade of other changes, not just in technology, but in economics and in society. All of us today are perhaps 30 times better off than our, uh, our ancestors a couple centuries ago because of these advances in this technology and the way that those have been applied. There's also a lot of disruption over those years. If you've read Charles Dickens, you know that it wasn't good times for everybody. Um, and there was a rocky road along the way and that we had to make some big societal changes, mass public education, social security, income taxes, antitrust laws, and a whole set of, of organizational changes in businesses that are well chronicled by economic historians as well. We think we are at the early stages of a similar inflection point, maybe even in a bigger inflection point. We're going to have to adjust the chart there to make it, have it go even more vertical uh, going forward. In the second machine age, it's um, not our muscles that are being augmented by machines, but our minds. And that has much more profound implications, we think. It has a, a whole new set of capabilities that are being affected. And I'm just going to touch briefly, we're gonna, we'll hear more about it, if you walk around MIT, you may see some interesting creatures roaming around that, that are signs of this, uh, this transformation. Um, but the data are, are quite striking in terms of the ability of the machines to do things that previously only humans could do. Uh, one example is in computer vision. Um, if you look at ImageNet, the, the charts there on the left of the diagram here, um, as recently as 2010, uh, the best machines got about 29% of those images incorrectly labeled. Today, they're down at close to human level, about 4% accuracy. And you know, humans are not 100% accurate. I wasn't quite sure if that was an orange or a lemon myself, so I don't blame the machine for getting it wrong, and I'm pretty sure that's not a bird over there. But uh, you can imagine that it's, 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 it's not exactly perfect, but at, at current uh, trends, it's, it's likely that machines are actually going to be superhuman. And that, of course, means that they can be used not just for image net, but they can be used for all sorts of other applications, whether it's in self-driving vehicles or helping to uh, diagnose cancer in medical images or, or recognize uh, faces of your friends on Facebook. We also see similar uh, breakthroughs in the just recent years in speech recognition, where today, um, if you walk down the street, you're very likely to see somebody uh, talking on their phone and, and probably not necessarily talking to another human, but quite possibly talking to a machine and expecting the machine to understand them and speak back to them. And that's because we've just recently be got to the stage where we have human level understanding of speech, uh, c conversational uh, speech. And that's an important breakthrough uh, as well. It's really what Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon described uh, about a 10 year period we went, where we went from mostly not understanding Machines mostly not understand what people are saying to machines fairly routinely understanding what they're saying. Another disruptive point in our timeline. Um, and of course, robotics are becoming more and more ubiquitous. Uh, in a little while, we'll be hearing from Gil Pratt, uh, who uh, ran the program at DARPA for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. 
that helped put in place some uh, amazing uh, robo robotic capabilities or help uh, sponsor those. But we see them in, in factories, uh, driving around on our roads, uh, flying in the air, uh, undersea, uh, and in our homes, um, increasingly ubiquitous there. And the progress there has also been quite rapid just in the past few years. And uh, some of the ones that have gotten the most attention have been in, in just playing games. Uh, the, a key breakthrough was when IBM's Deep Blue was able to beat Garry Kasparov in the chess championship about 20 years ago. Uh, later, uh, uh, almost a decade ago now, uh, uh, another IBM program uh, was able to beat uh, Jeopardy, uh, IBM Watson. Uh, earlier uh, last year, a team from uh, Google's Deep Mind was able to beat the Go champion of the, of the world. And that was considered an even bigger breakthrough because Go is a far more complex game than chess. And then just uh, last fall, a, a different team was able to uh, beat the world uh, poker championships, which involved a lot of bluffing and, and incomplete information. The key to all of these breakthroughs is machine learning. And that's the reason we have this AI and machine learning conference. Uh, there have been some important breakthroughs in, in mostly the past five or, or eight years, uh, often using deep neural nets. The roots go back further, all the way back to the 80s or even earlier in, in some cases. Uh, but the technology has improved quite dramatically. To s some of that is better algorithms. A big chunk of it is just more computer power. One of the uh, co-founders of DeepMind was telling me that uh, they ran some algorithms uh, for understanding speech, you can see there. And uh, they just put in the raw waveforms, had the neural net analyze them, and were able to outperform many of the uh, speech, all of the speech recognition systems that had been, people had been working on for 30 years. He said part of it was that they had better algorithms, but the bigger uh, access to computational power was a huge part of it. He did the math and, and found that if they had tried to run those same algorithms in the late 1990s, it would have taken literally centuries to run those algorithms. So the, the speed up was a big part of their success. But machine learning is a sort of a different way of solving a lot of these problems. For most of the information age, we had to painstakingly code or codify our knowledge, tell the machines exactly what we wanted them to do step by step. And most of you have probably at some point had to write a computer program for some purpose, even if it was only in school. And you know that if you, if you get a comma wrong or if you specify things a little bit incorrectly, um, the machine won't understand what it's supposed to do and the, and the program won't run. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge that we just don't know how to codify. I mentioned earlier recognizing uh, someone's face. It's very hard for me to describe how to, how, uh, to recognize a face. But machine learning does that in a different way by looking at lots and lots of examples and figuring out on its own what the rules and the principles are to come to conclusions. And this allows us to have machines do a lot more things than what they could previously and has profound implications not just for technology, but also for work in the economy. Um, a, a kind of a fun example here that I'll show you is using machine learning for, for playing Atari video games. The team at DeepMind, we can go ahead and, and start this video, um, trained the neural nets to play a, a whole bunch of Atari video games like Breakout. And at first, they weren't very good. Um, but after a little while here, as you can see, uh, so you can bring that up. No? It worked when we tested it about 20 minutes ago, but. Coming? Here we go. Um, so this is the game breakout. Some of you may have spent uh, a few hundred hours learning this on your own. Um, and it wasn't particularly good. You can see it's missing a lot, sometimes occasionally luckily hitting it. The machine was not given the rules of breakout. It was only given the raw pixels of the screen and told, here's a controller. You can move it left and right. And here's the score. Try and see what you can do to maximize the score. Well, after iterating a bunch, it started stumbling upon some strategies that worked, got to be pretty good, got to human level. And after 500 games, it even figured out some new strategies that the humans didn't even know they could do. The ones who had programmed it figured out how to send the ball around the back there and get a really high score. Um, and they took the same basic approach, feeding in, in the raw algorithms, not teaching it the rules, for about 30 different Atari video games. And for about half of them, 
they were able to achieve superhuman performance. Um, it was able to beat Space Invaders and Pac-Man and a number of other games. It was particularly good at games that had a quick, short reaction time. It wasn't particularly good at games that required more planning and strategy, but it opened up a bunch of possibilities. Now, that's not just games. You could take that same approach and you can gamify, if you want, all sorts of activities that we have in our economy. They took that neural net, the team at DeepMind, and they took all the data from one of their, uh, fr from the electricity consumption at one of their data centers. Um, data centers are a huge cost item at Google. Um, some of them use as much electricity as the city of Toronto, I'm told. And so if they can reduce the electricity consumption, it could be very important. They looked at the uh, incoming data about all the gauges and dials that they had in that data center, and they fed it into the um, neural net, and they said, we want you to, the score is to maximize the energy efficiency. We want you to use as little electricity as possible while solving all of the problems we need to solve in the data center. Now, this data center had already been heavily optimized by a bunch of very smart PhDs, some of the best in the world. So this was not um, an easy problem at all. It was one that our humans had already done their best to optimize, but they were able to radically improve the performance. Here's the, the data. Um, the overall efficiency, as you can see, was it was fairly inefficient initially, and then when the machine learning went on, it got dramatically more uh, better, about 15% overall reduction and a 40% reduction in energy in particular. Then when they turned it off again and went back to the humans, it got much worse. But you can imagine if you take that level of improvement and apply it to all of our systems, our factories, our warehouses, our transportation systems, we could get uh, a lot of improvement in our living standards. There are a whole bunch of other milestones that we're going to touch on, and I want to point you to the URL at the bottom of this chart. If you go to that URL, um, you can take the survey yourself. One of the things we'd be interested in learning from all of you today is what your thoughts are on where we are on this path towards uh, disruption from AI and machine learning. Here are a bunch of different p possible milestones that may be ahead of us, uh, many of them perhaps in the next decade. And you can imagine that they will have big implications for work, employment, and the economy. Um, in the panels today, we're going to talk about some of those disruptions, what's realistic and what's science fiction and what's not likely to happen. Of course, we don't know for sure. You can't make predictions about the future. But we can make some intelligent estimates about where we are and what the implications are likely to be. Now, I want to stress, while most of this is very good news, the pie is going to get much bigger. We're going to create uh, more wealth, more health, be able to solve more problems, even more leisure. Um, there's no economic law that says that everyone is automatically going to benefit from this. It's possible for some people to be left behind. In fact, it's even possible in theory for a majority of people to be left behind and that growing pie, all of it to go to a very, very small group of people. Unfortunately, to some extent, that's been what's happening in recent years. Over the past couple of decades, while productivity has continued to grow, perhaps not as fast as we would have liked, but grow nonetheless, and while GDP and GDP per person are at record highs in the United States, um, the median family, the person at the 50th percentile, is no better off now than they were in the late 1990s. How is that possible? Well, the overall pie has grown, but half the people haven't seen their share grow at all. Most of that has gone to about 1% of the people. That's not baked into the technology. That's a function of our policies, our choices, the way we organize our companies, the skill levels that our workforce has, and a bunch of other factors that we'll talk about today. But we have to recognize that while the technology is creating some powerful opportunities and giving us a lot of tools that we didn't have previously, it also is not automatically going to benefit everyone evenly. And in fact, some of the examples of like self-driving cars that we talked about uh, drive that home. We can get more convenient transportation, a lot more safety. Um, one of uh, Gill's goals at Toyota Research Institute is to make cars that are incapable of crashing, which would be great news, save uh, 30,000 lives in the United States alone. Um, but it also is going to change the capital to labor ratio in a lot of industries. It's going to have more capital, less labor. And if you're one of the people who makes a living by selling your labor, um, you're going to have to find some other way to make a living. So there are a number of open questions we're going to talk about today, uh, about which tasks are going to be affected, what the implications are, uh, what policies we should consider. Um, the most fundamental one is to recognize that 
technology is a tool, and we can use this tool in lots of different ways. We have a more powerful tool now than we ever had before, and it means we have more capabilities. My own view is that there's no shortage of important work that needs to be done, that the world has lots of unsolved problems, so I don't think we're entering a world without work. And most of that work still requires human involvement, and it will probably for some decades, although we'll hear from our panelists about where we are. So the issue isn't so much a world without work, it's a world where there's rapidly changing requirements for work and new types of skills and new types of capabilities, and we need to come up with systems that redeploy people to solve some of those problems going forward. We started doing some of that, and Devin Cook will talk about it a little bit uh, after lunch the, uh, with the uh, Inclusive Innovation Challenge. This is something that's designed to help identify and reward and recognize and encourage uh, individuals and organizations that are figuring out how to redeploy people to create not just prosperity, but shared prosperity. But we have a whole set of issues that we're going to dive into. David went ahead and described the uh, agenda already. So uh, let me just uh, stop there and thank you again for joining us today.